Hello and welcome to EPR with your favorite environmental enthusiasts, Nick and Laura. On today's episode, we talk to our very own Laura Thorne about managing burnout, embracing challenges, and what it means to be a role model. And finally, in honor of Laura's Florida roots, let's do a little fun fact about manatees. The cow-like creatures are thought to have inspired mermaid legends. That's right. Uh, they <laughs> People thought that they were mer people, maybe not as beautiful as they ended up being, but you know, you tell a person a story and then eventually they're like, oh yeah, you know, it becomes something else, right? That's kind of the, the idea behind what that happened. So I think that's pretty cool. How about that? All right, hit that music. Registration is open for a special NAEP webinar series, which is going to handle our 2023 regulations and rulings. There's going to be several big ones that we are anticipating coming out in 2023. And you can access three webinars that will address these issues, including CEQ's proposed phase two NEPA regulations, the EPA Army Corps revised section 404 regulations, and the Supreme Court ruling in the Sackett Waters of the United States case. If you sign up for these now, you automatically receive notice for each webinar once these issues are. So they're going to basically, after about two weeks after they're announced, we're going to have these webinars to uh, address what those, what the announcements are going to be, what the changes are and what those mean long term. We want to do this uh, as quickly as we can to get advice out to professionals as soon as possible. So this is a really exciting adventure and we hope you guys do bring it along. So yeah, look forward to that. You can register at www.naep.org. They will be really, really good. So I'm excited about that. So we go say we've got a question from the audience. And the question is, you know, when I'm working, when I'm, you know, trying to show strong work ethic and notice that I'm reading the question so that Laura has to start answering first. You know, I've got a strong work ethic. I want to be seen as someone who has a strong work ethic. But when I do that, I get assigned more things. I get more responsibility and then I and it affects my work life balance. So I'm working too much, not doing enough work, you know, life things. So how do we kind of balance those two things out? And I have thoughts, but you know, I asked it, so Laura has to answer first. Oh, who's starting the lob? Um yeah, I mean that's tough. You have to do a lot of things in the beginning of your career to show that you could do the work. I know I volunteered for everything and I did a lot of stuff. And I think back when I was starting my career, we didn't talk a lot about work-life balance. So it no. wasn't really, you know, I'm young there wasn't I, at this point in my life. <laughs> my focus is on my career, not my family work-life balance, you know? So it was okay to do that. I think there's less people who want to be okay with that now. So it's a personal choice, I think. And I think if you decide because balance doesn't mean equal it doesn't mean i have 50 percent of my time at work and 50 percent at home i have to decide what is balanced for me so if you are career ambitious and you would like to do 80 percent of your time focused on career good for you if you are young and starting a family early and you decide that you're going to be in the 50 50 boat that is a personal choice and you'll have to stick to it um which is also fine. easy yeah but it's fine yeah and i think so the point there is is that you have to Really dig deep into what you want and not look at what everyone else is doing. A hundred percent. And I would I would say too, it's you know, what is your goal? What are you trying to do? Do you yeah. want to be the person? Do you want to be leading the program? Do you want to be leading your industry? If you want to do those things, it's gonna take a lot of work. There's no balance. There's almost no balance. If you really want to be a leader of industry, you can't just, you know, well, I did my fifty percent, so now I'm gonna do my other. But that's okay. You don't have to be that. You know, there's a, there's a huge difference from being like the industry leader in the profession who also really enjoying your job, you know, having a good time, having a good experience, and then going home and leaving it at the door. It's okay to do that. Both of those are fine, but you have to be okay with it. It's really what you want to get out yeah. of it. And if you're, I mean, like people who work harder get noticed more and they will move up. But harder doesn't mean longer, it doesn't mean you know, you're putting in 20, you know, 80 extra hours a week or whatever. That's, you know, there's a line for that, like where it's too much, you're taking on too many things and you end up making mistakes. That's also a problem. So you've got to, you've got to kind of decide what you want out of the job and what you're trying to do accomplish with your own personal life. Like those, 
Those to me are really important questions that you have to answer. And very importantly, there is not a right or wrong. It's what you want. Take the time to think that through. And it, you can always say no. I think that's very important. You can always say no. You don't have to say yes to everything. You shouldn't say no to everything either. <laughs> that's not great. <laughs> but if you do really good work and you know, you've know you been doing a lot, you've been putting a lot of hours in, you're like, hey, I need a break. A good boss will be like, understood. Absolutely. I understand that. And, and we'll work on, you know, and it may not be immediate. You know, sometimes you might need, you know, there's a week where you're going to be more, you're going to have to put in more no matter what than others, right? That's just kind of the nature of work. But a good boss will say, okay, yeah, I don't want you to burn out. I don't want you to, you know, be up at all hours of night working for me. So take the time that you need, you know, give some balance, some balance, you, you know, it shouldn't be a hundred zero. It should never be a hundred zero either way. Right. But it doesn't have to be 50, 50. It's a really good point. Well, okay. So I know a young woman who works in cell development in a pharmaceutical company and she pretty much got promoted several times at the company she worked for. And then she got headhunted to go work at another company to help them fix their operations. And because she was known for being very good at process. And so she's very young, three kids, husband, obviously. And the husband, I think, does not work. So she may be doing everything at this time. And so... She's, you know, talk about work-life balance. Eh, it's all over the place. But <laughs> yeah. she knows that she's dedicated to advancing her career so she can retire early. And not a lot of people, young people especially, are willing. I talk to people in the career coaching about this. It's in my workbook. What do you want your retirement to look at? And they're like, are you crazy? I'm not prepared to talk about that. But this is how you answer this question. How yeah. much time do I dedicate to my career right now? How early do you want to retire? <laughs> so basically she had no life. Zero, zero, zero. She worked 12, 15 hour days for six months to get this company to a place it needed to be where people weren't throwing up their hands in the air and screaming, running out the door. Mm-hmm. The clients were getting the products that they were promised on time. And then she was able to take a little breather. But yeah, she was going crazy in the meantime. But understood the realities of it and what that was going to do for her career. And now she's been, I think, hired and moved into another company with a much better situation. So also, how long are you going to endure what you're right. going through is another thing to consider. Exactly. And like I said, like, I, I think that's a very good point because you know, we talk about work-life balance, like it's this static thing and it changes you know, over time. There might be like six months where it's really hard. And if you need to make a change, you make the change, which this person did too. Also, you know, it's like, I did the thing, I got this where I needed to be. And now I'm ready to to do, you know, a a, a little bit better balance, you know, and that's really hard for a family. It's always like, there's a big, big discussion point you have to make. And if you have the resources and means to do things, it makes it a little easier. If you have someone who's supporting the house while you're doing all the work, that helps a lot. You might not be in that situation. So maybe that doesn't really come into play. So there's lots of different things, lots of different nuances to that question. It's a good question. It's a really good mm-hmm. question. Yeah. The last thing I would say about that is that you also have to consider the realities of the work that you're in. If the work that you're in doesn't fit what you need to have for your work-life balance, like, you know, a hardcore global consulting company that's very fast paced and project based, they might demand of you certain things you can't say no to. And you have to understand that, yeah, you you have the right to say no, but they may have consequences and you may be better off finding a different place to be, you know, government, they let, they end typically nine to five weekends off that might better fit your situation. If you're looking for something more balanced. Yeah. But if you're like a private equity lawyer, you're going to be doing 80 hours a week at least. (laughs) So, you know, buckle up and that's different. It's different. Okay. All right. That's a good stuff. That question. Yeah. Why don't we go ahead and wrap up and get to our interview? Sounds good. Welcome back to EPR. Today, we have a very special guest. Some of you may or may not know already, our very own Laura Thorne. Uh, Laura, so glad to have you here. Woohoo! This uh, feels a little bit odd, but... I know, right? Yeah, and thinking back to us interviewing you last year, I'm like, oh God, what are they going to ask me? <laughs> <laughs> I had the same exact feeling, so I'm glad we can return the favor a little and <laughs> and have a little fun with you today. So... The show, we've had a lot of people that do a lot of different things. And I think to say you embody that spirit is kind of underselling all the stuff you do. So, I mean, 
So you're a biologist, you're a photographer, an environmental scientist, and a career coach, a publisher, et cetera, et cetera. I'm forgetting some things, I'm sure. But do you think like one of your career decisions really led to the next? Do they kind of all intertwine? Did you have interest in all of these things from a young age and you just decided, you know what, I'm going to do everything? Yeah. Before I jump in, I want to just say to everyone that Nick is interviewing me from a hotel room. So that's why you might sound a little bit different. It looks like he is dressed up to like moderate a football game. So <laughs> I do actually Look put me in the way. game, coach. Yeah. What are your ha- halftime adjustments here? Right. <laughs> <laughs> so I got to get used to this. Um, yeah. yeah, the career path. I talk about that to people every once in a while. They do stem one from the other and they are connected. It doesn't appear so on the outside. People are like, what are you doing today? (laughs) Um, And I, you know, I used, I can't say I used to worry too much about what people thought or whatever, but you know, it runs across your mind occasionally. But yeah, I mean, I do, you know, I'm an executive producer on a TV show, you know, still working on getting it published, but it's in the works and it's happening. And I've been a photographer since I was 14. So that is kind of like where that has led me. I've always been creative and a creator and an artist so i'm working in the art space trying to promote arts with that show so that's it may seem like an odd thing to be doing but it really has been a a natural progression of just you know i'm a big fan of continuous improvement and always looking for the next thing to do and pushing boundaries and limits of yourself and so that's where that has led career coaching i career coach environmental career seekers and that's just come from having my my big 10 year career as an environmental scientist and then kind of leaving, stepping out of that. And then, you know, when I graduated from the University of South Florida with my biology degree in 2005, by the time I was ready to retire essentially from my government job, um, the world had changed. Like climate change became real. The sustainability college had started in 2009 at USF. So there were options that didn't even exist. So I felt like, you know, if I was going to start over or try to go somewhere else, I just kind of already felt I wasn't outdated, but I really just had been because of NAP, actually, because I was president of TBAP, had been mentoring and talking to other people about changing careers. And so for me, it felt like, you know, I was a little burnt out. I was burnt out not only on working for someone else, but also just sort of the, you know, we've talked about this before, the stress of working in environmental field can be very depressing to go to work every day and make a little bit of progress to see a lot of stuff go backwards. So mm-hmm. I just felt like my place, my calling at that point was to help other people get into those roles. You know, if I could help a thousand people get into a job that they love, my impact actually goes further. So that's what I've been doing and I love doing it. So that was a natural progression. And then that helps me to stay involved here and to stay involved with NAP, you know, since I moved from Tampa now and live in Syracuse. So yeah. there's a couple of things. <laughs> yeah. Just, oh, just a couple. Right? Yeah. <laughs> My goodness. Well, it's funny because like uh, you haven't seen the questions, but, you know, we are going to touch on burnout in a bit. But before we do, uh, I love that you brought up, you know, that you do art and science. And one of the reasons we started the show is because we genuinely believe that there are a lot of environmental professionals that are really dynamic folks, you know, that do a lot of different things. They have a lot of different interests and no matter who you are, what you're doing, there's an environmental job for you somewhere, some way, shape or form. So how do you see the intersection of art and science? Where do you see them connect for you personally? And then just maybe in the, in the field in general? Yeah. Um, that's a great question. And, you know, I was just before we started here today, chatting with Sam about GIS. And that was one of the things I loved doing when I worked at EPC was just creating maps and telling a story. And I feel like GIS is a really artistic way to express what you're working on and to especially with story maps and different things that they have available now. But also I ran our pollution prevention grant program and, you know, started a newsletter underneath that, created posters for conferences on the projects we were working on. So there's there's a lot of opportunity to be creative You have to do science and technical writing for things like NEPA and reports to your clients. But at the same time, you know, the story has to be told about the earth and why this is important. And that can be told in a number of ways. It doesn't have to just be words, but it can be presentations and art. And, you know, it's bleeding now. Like I said, now that sustainability is an actual program and thing and climate change is for most of us 
<laughs> become reality. Um, yeah. You know, the ability to bring the art form into it, because that's how we're going to, the only way we're going to reach people, I think, who haven't already bought in. Yeah. Is to start speaking the different language. And art is that is one of those things that can kind of bridge no matter who you are, what your background is, you know, because you can pull emotion into it and you can draw people's attention. So I think whether you do social media and marketing or if you're a classical painter, you know, there's people that are, I know several artists here in Syracuse who do things with recycled materials and they're making costumes and cosplay and like really cool stuff. And even all of that is an opportunity to educate people about the need to improve our planet. Yeah, I mean, yeah, absolutely. And I love it. I love that you brought up story maps. You know, we're starting to use those more and more in in my job. And you, you hear Yeah, Deepa, your projects sound really cool. I mean, you know, but still, like when you talk about uh, I'm writing a technical report that's that said we say it's for people, but it's really for lawyers, right? But yeah. you know, there's I love seeing the change. I love seeing the shift and um <laughs> and it's really cool because people like, you know, like Laura, like you, get to kind of be the forefront of that and see where we were and where we're going. And it's really, really cool. But, you know, we, we mentioned earlier, you, you have all of these things going on. Were you always this determined? Like, you know, we want to know, <laughs> did Laura Thorne like wake up like as a baby and be like, you know what, let's go, let's go. We're going, <laughs> we're doing it. Like, we need to know this. How did this happen? Where did that come from? That determination? Right. Was I always a pit bull? Yes. <laughs> um, I have always created my Myers-Briggs personality test as an architect. I am always taking things apart. I remember my dad, someone had brought home a payphone. I think it was my dad, like the old kind that you see that are like all metal and it's super thick and you have to put a coin in it. So not like yeah. a payphone, like on the street, but like one you might, I don't even know where they would come from, but super old <laughs> with like the little cup for an ear holder, you know? Oh gosh. Okay. Yeah, I got you. I'm not I got sure. you. But um, I remember like, spending hours like trying to bust that thing open yeah. <laughs> because I wanted to see like what did it look like on the inside and mm -hmm. um but I also had my entire room was full of every kind of art I did charcoals for a while I did watercolor I did I built dream catchers so I had everything all the different kinds of art I would try everything so I don't think I don't know if I was always like I didn't have a direction so but I tried everything and I think yeah. I still embodied that where like I want to try everything. And if I like it, I'm going to keep doing it, you yeah. know? Um, and that's where, you know, people are like, Oh, you do this. And like, just pick a thing. Like I can't just pick a thing. I don't want to just pick a thing. That doesn't make <laughs> me happy. So you're, you're more of a generalist than a specialist then. Is that what you'd say? I would say, but I think you can specialize in learning and trying and you know what I mean? Like I am an inherent problem solver. Mm -hmm. So and I think that's where, you know, we strategize on the podcast. I have two LLCs right now and my business partners don't have a business background, but I have brought them in and we strategize, you know, we yeah. sit down and we actually plan. And for me, it's fun. And I think I've made it fun for them. You know, they don't argue. <laughs> <laughs> they come to our planning meetings um, with smiles. So, there you, go. <laughs> um, you know, the whole process of it, because we get stuff done, I think if you strategize and you don't get things done is when it becomes like, you know, life killing, whatever, yeah, killing your yeah. soul. But, um, but yeah, I think, you know, yeah, you can specialize in being creative and coming up with new ideas. Heck yeah. I mean, that was exactly what I was hoping you'd say. <laughs> That's <laughs> awesome. Maybe we, we've been doing this. You know me well yeah. enough. You probably yeah, I was about to say. answers already. <laughs> No, but it's brilliant because I love it. We we do this thing where we put things, we, lo we love putting stuff in boxes. And even sometimes that means you oversee things or overlook things or you miss the point, right? And so you try to make things fun. You try to have things that are enjoyable. You try to be engaging. So what are those tips for strategizing, for example, like to avoid that kind of thing? Because, you know, nobody wants to sit in a meeting that's, you know, three hours long. and At the end, you're exactly where you were when you started. So how do you focus that? Because it's really challenging. Yeah, I think really some of the keys, one is prioritizing, you know, if you spend two hours working on the thing that wasn't the thing that you should have spent the two hours working on, <laughs> yeah. instant frustration, right. right? So really getting keen on, you know, listing all the things that you should be doing and saying, this is the one that needs to happen right now. I do it daily. You know this. <laughs> yeah, um, I was doing it on my planner right before this started. I had a whole bunch of things this morning that were written down. And then halfway through the day, I was like, nope, I need to reassess this. Yeah. Um, and I think you also have to be flexible. So, you know, a lot of people have this mindset that because you have a strategy and you have these steps to do and that you can't, that it's rigid, you know, you can't break away from that, but you have to be flexible. You've got to be able to say, 
all right, this worked yesterday, but today something's off. And right. you know, maybe maybe it means we just put it off till tomorrow, or maybe it means we put it off for six months or longer. But flexibility has to be part of that. And that's really hard for some people to do because you've got to kind of walk the line between, okay, we have to get this done and eh, maybe this isn't right. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, but I think frequent check-ins is the other thing. So a lot of people want to say, okay, okay, team, here's our six months plan. See you in eight months. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, right. You got to say, here's our six months plan. I'll see you next week. And those meetings have to be prioritized and there has to be an agenda. And you have to say, like, we have a to-do list with dates and what's been we're working on and we check in with it. And when someone goes, I don't know what to do today, check in with the do the list, like what's on the yeah. list. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, it's, it's a lot of moving parts, but once you kind of get in those habits, it's all about creating habits, then, you know, you can make strategy more of a way. I always say it's a way that you should operate, not a thing you should be doing. Yeah. Yeah. And I think it's a, it's a great point too. It even, even like on the meeting level, right? Where you're like, we have this meeting, we've had it forever, we'll keep having it. It's like, okay, well, let's reevaluate why we even right. need to have it. Do we? You know, and sometimes the answer is yes. And sometimes the answer is, you know what? We have a bunch of other meetings. Let's focus all of our efforts on that one. And if we need to touch base, we will. And so, yeah, that's really, really cool. And it kind of segues into what you mentioned earlier, right? Because it's really easy to get burned out if you're not paying attention, if you're just trying to, you know, go, 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 go. You know, heck, I feel like today is wearing me out. You know, I've had I've had one of those days where it's thing to thing to thing to thing. So what advice would you give for avoiding burnout? You found a new way to do to give back, to do the thing that you want to do without being the person who's doing the thing. Are there other ways to avoid burnout without maybe without leaving the industry or doing different things in the industry? Can you stay at your job and still do it? Yeah. And, you know, to clarify, I didn't leave only for that reason. I love my <laughs> I nah. had best. I had the best job in the world. Um, best coworkers just wasn't the best for my future advancement. So mm -hmm. I needed to go. And, and really, you know, the light bulb came on that, like, I don't want a boss. I want to create and be the ruler of my own world and really shape things for myself. I have no one to answer to but me, whether things fail or succeed. It all lands on me. Yeah. Um, and so regardless of circumstances, that's the epiphany that I came to. So now, because of that, I can only work on things that I want to work on. And that doesn't mean there are things that I have to do that are not fun. Right. I do my yeah. budget every Friday and I, I'm still doing administrative work. I delegate as much as I can, but there's only so much that you can do of that. And you still have to do your own strategizing and coming up with all of this. And, you know, I manage other people and I do love that part because the mentoring is involved, but it's really, you have to like what you're doing. You don't have to love it. You don't have to, you know, if you're in your first job and you're out there in the field with mosquitoes and heat and whatever, you know, you yeah. might hate that part of it, but you have to like that you're serving a mission that's doing a thing and you're part of it or something. If you come home and you just absolutely hate your boss, hate the work that you're doing, everything else, do something else. Yeah. Yeah. You know, there's I mean, such this mindset of like, this is my job. This is my job forever. But I'm here to tell you, no, it's not. <laughs> <laughs> And, I, you know, it's another thing that I like that you said, you know, I do what I love, but I don't love all of it. And I don't know if you could maybe expand on that a little bit, because I think when people say that, you know, the, this is my dream job, this is the job I love, that you almost have this, this, this expectation, which is impossible to reach, that you love every single day that you're doing every single thing with your new job. Like, how can you complain about a dream job, you know? Yeah, I do try to be mindful of that. You know, there are times when I do want to complain, but I have to, you know, if you, anyone, you listened to this before, you know, that role models is important to me. I try to be that role model for all of the young persons that are working with me and the people I mentor. I'm not going to show up and be complaining. You know, I get really frustrated by this whole, like, everyone should be vulnerable. Bosses and leaders need to be vulnerable to a point. I don't get yeah. to come in and complain and tell you about my problems. Those are my problems. I don't <laughs> need to dump those on the people who work, who are doing work for me or with me, you know, at a lower pay or for something that's not their mission and their passion, you know, yeah. um, that's not part of my job, but right. to mentor them on things they should avoid in their own path. Sure. But to just sit, sit and complain or get therapy from the people I work with. That's, <laughs> no, <laughs> that's, that's right, negative. Right. Backing up to the question, you know, what you love, but not loving all of it and what that really means. You know, what it yeah, means so to do a dream job. 
Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, people also complain that like, oh, Facebook stinks because everyone's just fake and not real. But I'm sorry. Would you do follow people who do nothing but complain? You're <laughs> following them. So yeah. it's not, yeah. it's, this is, we don't want to see that. Like, um, right. there's true. a lot of stuff on there about mental health and all that. And that is important. But I'm not going to go on my Instagram and post and tell you when I'm having a bad day. I'm going to share with you the positive stuff and the encouragement and the things I want you to see to live your best life. But the reality is that living your best life is still life. Mm -hmm. And as the Buddha says, life is struggle. It's going to still be hard. There are going to be days that just absolutely suck. There are going to be yeah. days where you were thought you were on having living your best life in your dream job. And then, you know, your dog will die or your mom will be, get sick or you'll get sick. And, you you know, mm -hmm. th there are things that are out of your control, but you have to realize that that's just part of life. And you're either going to be the kind of person who picks yourself up yeah, or not. And, you know, I mean, I've, I've had setbacks and then sometimes they take a while to pick yourself up. But the key is just doing it regardless of how long it takes or what method you use to do it. Well, except for like drugs and alcohol but <laughs> <laughs> other methods drink. but yeah because you know you, you don't want things to be a crutch you have to be able to rely on, on yourself and your own self-worth which is you know not always easy and you know you talk about leaders needing to be you know the term that i hear all the time is empathetic you know that doesn't mean like you said a therapy session it means a lot more than that and i swear you didn't see these questions beforehand but, but my next question is like, what does it mean to be a role model? You're talking about role model way and, you know, trying to, you know, live the way that you want other people to embody. But what does that actually, what does it mean to be a good role model? Yeah. So for me, and I am thinking about this a lot, I'm interviewing people and I'm writing a book around it. So there's a lot to unpack, but just at its basics, you know, we haven't really as a society or as people defined what a role model is it's danced around in books it's danced around you'll see it in quotes you see it in tv shows it's everywhere every movie every tv sitcom ever ever made someone is the role model right. someone is the person doing the right thing and the other person is the person who did the wrong thing and then they describe how you, why you should do the right thing um right. <laughs> right. Right. every single one but what we don't talk about is that everyone is a role model regardless my parents were role models, but were they role model parents? <laughs> you know, I totally understand. They were great that. parents, but yeah. they weren't like role models for getting your kids into doctorships and, you know, because um, they didn't right. do that. They couldn't they couldn't be that because they aren't that they didn't have that. Right. So, right. you know, if you're you're raised by your uncle and your uncle's an alcoholic, that's a role model. But you have to learn and decide whether that's a role model you want to follow or not. So for me, it's I want to be creating programs and getting people to think about how every hat that they wear, you're a different kind of role model in that day. I don't have to yeah. buy into, let's say Elon Musk, for example, because he's like all over. People love him or they hate him or whatever. Mm -hmm. He can be a role model for like how to be a great businessman, but he doesn't have to be my role model for how to be a husband or a father. He doesn't have to be the role. He doesn't have to be the end all be all. Right. I can say, this is my role model for this. Of course, it gets dicey when someone does something, you know, your role model, let's say there's, we talked about that one football player, uh, let's not call names, but um, <laughs> right, right. You know, you're like, oh, I love this guy. And then you're like, oh, he, yeah. he did that. Like Michael Jackson, yeah. you know, um, yeah. huge, huge role model for millions and billions of people. And then, then what happens? So I think we need to be teaching young people how to deal with that. How do you deal yeah. with parents and teachers who you thought were role models and then you see them, you know, you see a teacher, the, the whole problem with whether what teachers post on social media is because at school they're your role model, but then you see them in real life and they're, you know, partying or something. That's confusing for a young kid. Yeah. So anyway, I think we all need to just be more as, especially as we progress in our careers. And if we really, if we're throwing the M word around, we're saying we're mentors, we need to be considering more that we don't pick and choose where our influence lands. It lands where, where it wants it to land. Yeah. It's a great point. And it's really, you know, I think you and I have talked a bunch about people being dynamic, right? No one's static. No one's perfect. But we often put labels on stuff. We say this, this is a great role model. This is a bad one. And we, we forget, you know, context. You don't really know some of the people that, that you are considering role models, like you said. So, 
Yeah, you know, like I think between, you know, we we really do see we talk a lot about you know how people are dynamic, but we tend to put them in static boxes. We tend to say this is who you are today, forever, always. But that's not the reality, right? We all do and act different ways in different situations and people just like you said. So how do we connect with younger younger people trying to you know who are just figuring this out because this this it can be quite shocking when you have a role model who breaks your heart like that's really difficult you know and having a way to navigate that without coming across like you're you know telling somebody how to do something because that's not really what we people want they don't want you to say hey i know more than you here's the thing because that's not going to work either right the here's the deal <laughs> like nobody wants that so how do we avoid that and still connect with people. Yeah. And the whole entire thing is exposure. So, you know, I can turn that the other way around. I was talking to a young person who was in the closet for lack of a better term, but, and his parents just couldn't, when he wanted to come out, his parents couldn't handle it. So then he, he found himself having all these conversations, telling them why, why it's okay, why they should be accepting of it. Why, 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 why? And of course they weren't having any of it. And then they were just arguing yeah. all the time. Yeah. And so the thing is that you're not trying to force or tell anybody how they should live. You're giving them just an insight in how they could live or how they could think. So again, going back to our social media, the more we can, and I'm, you know, <laughs> Some will say, well, you're making this fake positivity. It's not fake positivity. It's real. The more that we can display good behaviors and what we think anyway are the right. Like, let's go back to environment showcasing that we do what we do for sustainability in a public way or just in a way that other people will maybe see it. And then like I might go, oh, I didn't know Nick had a composting pile. And I can call Nick and go, hey, how do I do that? Um, So the same thing for younger people. If they only have access to their teachers and their parents and an uncle and a grandma, and none of them have ever made it out of their situation or have even worse, like, you know, a lot of kids here in Syracuse, their their uncles are drug dealers. And it's like they need access and exposure to other people. So how can we get them in programs? How do we get them to watch different things on TV and let them know that those are options for them to you can have this. You could be like that. So. It's not only just seeing, but then it's experiencing as well. So I think the more we can offer opportunities and experiences to people, you get them and they have to see it on their own. Like having these, yeah. like, you should do this or you should be like that. It doesn't work. And I see that all the time with career coaching. People will say, what kind of job should I get? And I'm like, I can't tell you. Every time I recommend a job, they go, nah, I don't think that works. <laughs> whatever. And then I go, okay, well, I think this sounds like, no, that won't work. Or no, I volunteered with that. And it's like, okay, <laughs> you have yeah. to figure this out on your own. But the yeah. problem is when people don't have exposure to things. Yeah. So for myself, like I lived that, like I said, I didn't have any direction. I was so talented and so much energy and wanting to be involved and build and do things, but nowhere to go with it. I didn't, you know, I've coded, I built a program for a global company and moved to Ireland and then came back to school and went back to school for biology. Cause I had no path to follow, Yeah. you know, and looking back, I could have owned my own tech company or something, but there was no, there no females in those roles back then. And there was no internet and social media for me to see it. So that's another spin for me on social media, where I think this is a, there's the good side of it. If we choose to use it this way, where people can actually see that there are different things that they can do. So I have hope for the next generation that they have access to more people that way and experience uh, it. Great answer. It really is. But all I can think of is what we would call your company. And Thorn Corp. <laughs> There's got to be. No, I, you know, it's it's really brilliant. And like I say, one of my favorite things uh, talking with you is, is, you know, we're both thinkers. We're both creatives in a lot of different ways. But there's a lot of creativity here, even in the conversation. Like you talk about being a role model and it reminds me, you know, you don't say leader, right? Not everybody wants to be a leader. You can still be a role model without yes. being a leader, uh, which is just a brilliant thing that you're saying. So we talk a lot about leaders, but what advice would you have for, for people who are not interested in taking that leadership role necessarily and want a more technical approach to their careers? Yeah, no, that's a great point. I'm glad you brought that up. And it is, again, one of those things that lately there's because of social media and there's all this and thought leader culture, whatever you might want to call it. Mm-hmm. There's been this surgence of people who are running around saying, I'm a leader and just like vomiting their grand advice for all the rest of the world to hear. So again, when you talk about, you know, 
how do we tell people how to live better stop stop even trying yeah. just you live yeah. better and just show people there's a there's a way right um, yeah the people who want to follow you they will follow you but yeah. um ugh, anyway <laughs> that, that side <laughs> of it is really kind of rubbing me the wrong way lately but i have a friend for example who works at like a big contracted engineering from honeywell or, or one of those places i'm not sure that's the right or jacobs or something like that and yeah. ugh, insanely smart insanely smart but he has zero interest in anything leadership, doesn't want to read a leadership book, doesn't want to have because he kind of I think people think and there is when you start running around calling yourself a leader that there's responsibility with that. And a lot of people don't want it. They don't want and it's not just the responsibility, but also, you know, there comes a lot of troubleshooting and people relationship management and yeah. that stuff when you're, you know, acting in a supervisor capacity or something. And some people don't want it. And that's fine. But you still have to understand that maybe in the workplace, you don't have a lot of influence and you're just there to do your job, which can be fine. But you're still going to go home and be somebody's brother or father or cousin. And there's still, you know, one of my cousins was one of my greatest influencers when I was younger. And he's a he's a total vagabond now that really hasn't. Um, I don't even I don't even know. He's like a ghost. But when he was younger, he traveled and took off places. And I was really inspired by that, you know. So I think. For anyone who's like, I don't, I don't want to be a leader. I'm not a leader. You still have to consider that anyone who can see you, especially someone who's younger than you or not even your parents can be influenced by you, you know, anyone around you in your circle of friends, family, whatever, in your community, your neighbor, you can be a, the role model neighbor person, you know, like you can be the person who's nice to everyone who, who moves into your neighborhood. So it's not just about leadership and who can I get to follow me and do my bidding, but how do I show up in my best way in all of the different ways that I live so that I can encourage other people to do the same? And then if we're all doing that, then we all can elevate. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> it's so good. I'm like, I'm like, yeah, go on, go on, go on. <laughs> and I know it's, it's totally unfair because we, we really do. We know we're running a little bit out of time here, but I could talk to you about this forever. This is so great. And we do a segment. I don't know if you know this, Laura, but we do a segment on the show <laughs> called Field Notes, right? Where we Woo! like to to get stories from the field, from people who have been there. And I know you have another story. We've heard a few from you, but I know you've got another one there for us. So give us another fun example of you being out in the field. Oh gosh, field stories. Okay, I got to think about which one I want to say. <laughs> a funny one or a scary one? or I mean, it's me. if it's me, I always want a funny one. So. Right. <laughs> okay, well, I could just talk about... So <laughs> when you go out in the field, you go out, You especially when you're new to a job, you go in the field with other people typically. And yeah. I just want to talk about one of my favorite past cast of characters from when I worked <laughs> in DC. His name was Glenn. And Glenn was just like the nicest person, but he also was a little slow moving. And so I, <laughs> I just want to talk about Glenn because Glenn was awesome. He's the nicest person you ever met. And uh, I used to go out with Glenn and then, so you go in the field and you're not, you know, you have no authority. You're just, hey, I'm, I'm the new kid here, right? Yeah, so yeah. you have to do what the other person is doing because again, role models influence. So <laughs> like, okay, who am I learning from here? <laughs> yeah. Uh, the ability to identify who's a good role model and not is very important in your early careers. So, but Glenn, we used to, we would have to take the boats out on different uh, runs to go collect from, we were doing the ambient water monitoring sampling and Sometimes we would drive a bigger boat and sometimes right through downtown Tampa. Fortunately, I never had to do that with Glenn. But I remember taking our hmm. skiff to one of the river access sites. And this was the multiple occasions, but this one occasion, well, every time you went out with him, he would do this thing where he would, his reflection, his reaction time was kind of slow. So we would drive through an intersection, towing a boat, knowing we can't slam the brakes. And so we would drive through a red light and he just honked the horn. Like, <laughs> so you're just like, <laughs> I hope nobody hits us. <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> so you're just like holding on to for dear life, like, oh my God, I hope we make it there. Um, and then this <laughs> one day we're there in again, I don't even know anything about boats at this point. I haven't learned all the stuff about how to like now I can navigate a boat pretty yeah. well after those years. But at the beginning, we pull up the river and the current is ripping. And so he gets out there. I back the the boat in and then he barely has held on to the rope and the boat is just like 
floating going. down the river. <laughs> <laughs> and then you're like, oh, oh God, gosh. please don't fall in. What am I going to do if you fall in? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I don't even know how to. Be- <laughs> oh, that's great. So, yeah. So really, there's a lot of stories of just like the antics of going in the field with someone different than yourself. But that was I, Glenn was special. <laughs> oh, man. I, I don't know why. It just reminded me like I remember being in the field with somebody and she's in front of me navigating to a site. And then like I just hear this commotion. Some sort of animal makes a sound. I'm not sure what it is. And like she is flying past me and i'm like what just happened (laughs) and like we found a turkey nest actually and it's like 13 eggs beautifully pristine but the turkey flew at her face and i'm like well it's good to know that if a bear comes i'm toast she was gone i never saw her i almost i'm pretty sure i never saw her again so yeah i love that (laughs) we love field stories too and uh thanks for sharing another one with us but um yeah, let's we, let's talk about too. We want people to start sharing those. We want to read more field yeah, stories. So yeah, use please do. Field story on social media so we can read those. Yeah, we'll read any that we see. We'll put them up. We'll put them on the show because those are so fun. <laughs> we'll screen and, them and then we'll put them on the show. Yeah, yeah. Come on, yeah. It'd be really fun. We would love to have that. So, you know, before we let you go, I want to ask. Uh, you know, we've been doing this show for two years, so. We know a lot about you already, but you guys did this to me last year. And so I'm doing it to you this year. Tell us something we don't know about you. Ah. Oh, love when things come back around full circle. <laughs> Revenge. It's so hard. Two years of conversations. It's hard to know what people don't already know about me. <laughs> um, you know, we hint at some of the things I do for fun and for money to pay my bills. Um mm-hmm. But okay, so one of the things I think that we have not talked about that is pretty cool, I have to say, is that I lived in a motorhome for three years. For three years? Yep. I lived in a 35 foot 2000 Fleetwood. It was gorgeous on the inside and a rust bucket underneath. (laughs) (laughs) Two slide outs. Um, Yeah. I lived on someone's property in the back and then I would take it somewhere like every week, every four weeks or every six weeks, I'd take it to the beach and camp and I would go, I went to North Carolina. And then after I quit EPC and before I started off on my own business journeys, I drove it from Tampa to Yosemite National Park and back by myself and my two cats. Podcat Podcat went to California. (laughs) What? Oh my gosh. What was that like? It was the most amazing out of body experience ever. Yeah. It literally, because I was traveling west for some reason, it just, and I also at the same time was audiobooking Stephen King's book about JFK, which is a time travel yes. novel. Yeah. Yeah. It literally felt like I was traveling through time, like every, like the rest of the world was moving on and I was just taking a sidestep. Oh my gosh. So, how did you plan that trip out? What did you even like? Like, I'm going out west to the end. Is that what you did? Or or did you actually like, okay, tomorrow, tonight I'll be here. Tomorrow I'll be there. So on and so forth. Yeah, it sort of started that way. So I ended up at a point where I didn't have a job. Mm -hmm. And I didn't have any significant other at the same time. And then I was like, I live in a house on wheels. (laughs) What should I do? I also, I will say one of the things that is a real thing is PTSD from a job. Yeah. And I had some serious self-doubts and self-worth issues from my most recent relationship that I ended and also the job. Mm-hmm. So for me, I needed something to like, like I talked about earlier, sometimes you got to take drastic measures to pick your blob of jelly self up. <laughs> yeah. And instead of, you know, I wallowed in it for a little bit and then I was like, I got to do something. And so, mm-hmm. you know, the universe literally spoke to me and said, you live in a house on wheels. <laughs> <laughs> you can literally drive. <laughs> and so I said, all right, I'm pulling up stakes and I'm going. You cats ready? <laughs> They'd yeah. already done their weekend adventures. So they they were used to that part, but they didn't like it. Yeah. And then, yeah, I started out planning. I knew where I was going. Um, I was safe about it. I knew that I was only going to drive a few hours in the day. So that if I broke down, I was always broke down in daylight and stuff like that. And, and there's a whole nother hour of conversation we could have about the adventures i had on this trip but um i mean but oh i made it what a tease i know i know wow that was my hobbit adventure i made it there and back (laughs) 
And I came yeah. back a much stronger, better person ready for the next phase of my life. Dang. Well, okay. Well, yeah. What? Oh, I do want to ask you so much more, but yeah, I know we're running out of time, so I don't want to. Uh, and it's a good tease for some other time, right? We'll, we'll we'll come back on this. I've got road trip stories. Heck yeah, we'll we'll do some, and maybe that's where our sense of adventure really took off on both of us. That's kind of fun. So, like I say, before we let you go, you know, we always do these things. So, is there anything else you want to talk about, or anything we didn't ask you? That is a great question, and right in this moment, I'm amazed that all of our guests do such a great job at answering that question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I guess. You know, I would just like to say that I I think there's a lot of doom and gloom in the world and a lot of opinion that we're sliding backwards and, that you know, things are not moving forward. And I know that it really feels that way. And that is a reality for a lot of people. But mm-hmm. we all have to work together and then also do our own self-work to move ourselves forward. No one's going to do it for us. There's no mission to Mars that's coming that's going to save us all. Life is a struggle which has been determined for thousands of years, and it always will be. We have right. more modern conveniences and things right now than any of us know what to do with. You know, I'm in the kitchen like, hmm, I need a gadget to cut my eggs. No, I don't. <laughs> I need a butter knife, and that works just fine. Right. Um, <laughs> we are spoiled. Right. Um, and people who we're, you know, people who listen to this podcast, we travel. We're, you know, travel brings perspective, and you, you get to see what happens in the rest of the world. But moving here to Syracuse, I'm surrounded by a lot of people who haven't traveled a lot Uh and they don't have the same understanding that life is struggle everywhere. We have to realize that we have to be part of the solution and not just sit back and complain about things that are happening. So I don't know if that's a great place to leave it, but let's all do better. (laughs) Yay. Yeah. Yeah. Just be curious. I love it. So of course, Laura, always a pleasure. We are a little biased, but Thank you for taking the time with us today. Let the people know where they can reach out to you. I have about 17 emails. They all fun to <laughs> Laura Jean Thorne, J-E-A-N-T-H-O-R-N-E at gmail.com. And of course, LinkedIn, Laura J. Thorne. Any other socials, Twitter, I'm there too. Twitter is Laura underscore Pura underscore Vita. And yeah, reach out. You know, I'm I'm an open book. If anybody has questions or needs help with something or anything. I'm here to connect and that's my mission in life is to help other people do what they want to do. Awesome. Really appreciate the time, Laura. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. That's our show. Thank you so much, Laura, for being here today. Please be sure to check us out each and every Friday. Don't forget to subscribe, rate, and review. See you, everybody.